All right, just a brief recap from last week because chapter 19, we're starting in the middle of the story here. So if you remember last week, and, and it's, it's essentially repeated, but um, the king of Assyria sends Rapshiki, so you know, sends his messengers, you know, the captains of his host or whatever to come down to Jerusalem. He comes down into Judah, he goes to Jerusalem and, and, and basically has given him a warning and saying, you know what, don't fight us. You know, who are you relying on? Don't rely on Egypt. They can't help you. Don't rely on your God. You know, we've already defeated all the other gods of these other lands. So don't think that the Lord's going to save you. And, and basically just trying to scare them. They're, they're speaking to the people that are on the wall, you know, the wall around the, the city and trying to scare the people. But remember at the very end of uh, chapter 18, it said that the people didn't answer him. They answered him not a word because King Hezekiah told them not to answer and one thing that's really interesting, and I'll just make this point now, we just, we just finished reading chapter 19. At the very end, it talks about, you know, the king of Assyria, he ends up dying as a result of his own children killing him. What a wicked man to have your own, and what wicked children to kill your own father, right? And, and, and that shows you, you know, this big tough guy going around and, and beating everyone. How does, how does he end up dying? Well, he goes home in shame against a really small group of people from Judah. Judah is a very small group. For him to lose to Judah and then be disgraced and go home and have his own children kill him, oh, how the mighty have fallen. Amen. And this is the way that God operates. And this is kind of the theme we're going to see in chapter 19, how you know, the, the, the whole bulk of the story is really just about trusting in the Lord, relying on God to protect you and to save you, which is exactly what King Hezekiah does. With, with the, the fear being thrown at him, with this great mighty army that have defeated so many other people, everything against you coming in to, to, de to defeat you and relying on the Lord to protect you and just turning to him. Hezekiah had already, previous to this, turned unto the Lord and was repairing the house of the Lord and was you know, getting things back on track because the previous king, his father, had, had, had screwed things up and, and went the way of Baal and you know, whatever, just was doing uh, things that were not right. So he was trying to get things back and he had a great heart. And, and uh, I think it was at the beginning last week of chapter 18, it might have been the previous week, I think it was, yeah, it was chapter 18, saying how Hezekiah had, you know, there was none like him before him or after him that had the same heart that he had to, to serve God. So that was, it was a great statement about who Hezekiah is. So last week, basically, the, the, the messengers came and they were saying all this stuff about how we're going to chew you up and spit you out, basically, right? It's a rough, a rough paraphrasing of what they said. And... Um, King Hezekiah was not, did not go out to meet them. He sent his own messengers to go and, and, and talk with, the, with the, the King Sennacherib, the king of Assyria's messengers. So now in 19, what's happening is they're relaying the message to King Hezekiah. And that's where we pick up here in verse number one. So let's look down. Verse number one, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes. Rent means he, he, he tore his clothes. I mean, his and this is something you find throughout the Bible when people are really upset when something you know, happens that makes them real sad or upset. They end up rending their clothes. They, they tear their own clothing and cover, he covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. So when people get upset in the Bible, what they would do is you know, kind of tear their clothing, put on sackcloth and, it's really, and, and maybe cast dust on their head. And what it is, it's, it's a way of humbling themselves and bringing themselves really low. Right, kind of tattering their clothing, putting on some sackcloth, which is just just a, you know like a cloth, which is just a just a kind of just cover yourself with a sack. I mean, that's what it's a sackcloth, and it's it's nothing fancy at all. And he's the king. This is King Hezekiah, right? He's, so he's putting on this sackcloth, and and you know people throw dust on their head and stuff, and just just bringing themselves really low to entreat a high, mighty God. Because that's the only one that can help you in situations like this. You have a kingdom that has just been defeating nation after nation after nation now is coming after you. And they've already, if you remember from the previous chapters, they have already kind of defeated in getting into the land of Judah, headed towards Jerusalem. So, so some of the fenced cities that were kind of outlying the, the, the main city have already been taken. And people have fled from there, you know, into, into Jerusalem, whatever. And this is their stronghold now. 
And uh, it says in verse number two, and he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. So now he wants to hear from God. It's his first reaction. You know, his first reaction is, you know, he's upset, he's grieving, he, 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 he humbles himself, and then the people he sends to, to get a word from the Lord, he makes sure they're also humbled. They're also wearing sackcloth. You know, they're, they're, they're humbling themselves before hearing anything from God. And honestly, this is the way that we ought to be entreating God the Father when we entreat the Lord. It's too easy, and we, we live in a, a, Christi a Christian culture these days to kind of bring God down to the level of just like your buddy, yeah. right? And that's not the way the Bible portrays our Lord at all. God is lifted up. God is magnified. God is, is, is above the highest of heavens. I mean, he's, he, is, he is greater in everything and, and deserves our commands, our respect, and our fear. And that's why anytime anyone is confronted with God in any form, like, you know, be it a mighty voice or a bright light, what do they do? They fall down on their face as dead. Because that's what it's like to be in the presence of such a powerful, mighty, holy God is that you are nothing in his, uh, in, in, in his presence. And you fall down on your face. And that's what everybody in the Bible does. And that's why at the end of everything, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord when they're in his presence. Amen. Absolutely. Nobody is going to have that stiff of a neck or rebellious of a heart. They won't be able to do it. They're going to be too scared stiff to, to do anything else but to bow their knee and to confess. I and I don't care who you are. We have people these days that have these attitudes and they think they're all tough. And they're putting up a big front. Oh, I'll never bow to anybody. And they'll have this type of... You, yes, they will. Yes, they will. Everybody will. The Bible says every knee shall bow. And we need to just keep a healthy fear of the Lord in our minds. A healthy respect for God. And look, there's nothing wrong with having a fear of the Lord and still knowing that He loves us. It's a good thing to have. It's a healthy thing to have. Let me put it this way, because it's really easy to understand, especially if you have kids and you're trying to raise up children to be good children, you can't just be, as a parent, you can't just be their best friend. That relationship's not going to work. We see the ramifications of that today because there's so many split homes, so many people are divorced, and then they want to gain the, the affection of their child over the affection of, of their ex-spouse or whatever. Elizabeth, come up here and get Jonathan. So what they do is they try to befriend their children, their 10-year-old, their 12-year-old, their 7-year-old, and be their best buddy, and it doesn't work. You can't be your child's best friend if you're going to raise them properly. They need to be disciplined. Leslie, you need to come get this child right now. It's not going to work. My children need to have a proper fear of my wife and I if they're going to grow up right. Because here's the thing, when you, when you have friends, your friends aren't going to take you out and spank you behind, right? Your friend, uh, that would be weird, wouldn't it? Your friends don't do that. Your friends are there to have laughs with and go hang out with and, and have fun, just, just play around. That's what friends do. That's the relationship of a friend and that's a normal relationship to have with a friend. You get to know each other, you hang out. But there's no discipline, there's no punishment coming from your friends. That comes from an authority figure in your life. And with children, they need an authority figure in their life. Otherwise, they're going to grow up thinking there's no consequences for their actions. Otherwise, they're going to think that, they can, that anything goes and that everything's just fine. And they can't do that. So as parents, we need to teach them and discipline them. And they need, they need to be reproved and they need to be punished. And we are children of God. And God is going to do the same thing to us, and we can't have this attitude. I mean, think about it. Think about the lack of respect if my children just started talking to me like I was just their buddy. Instead of saying things like, yes, sir, or yes, daddy, I'll do that, and, and, and having respect. I mean, that would be so backwards. But that's how many families operate these days. And then your kids end up growing up not having respect for anybody. If you don't have respect for your own parents, who are you going to respect? You're going to have growing up no respect for any authority, and then they're going to end up in prison 
because they're going to do stupid things because they have no respect for anyone or anything. They're going to end up stealing and, and hurting other people and doing whatever they want to do because no one's ever taught them discipline. No one's ever taught them right from wrong and, and shown them that there are consequences for your actions. And the same reverence that our children ought to have for us as parents, even more so we ought to have for God as being our father. And we need to have this, this humility and respect and never just get to the point, you know, it's, it's harder when you don't physically see God. See, I mean, my parents physically see, or my parents, my, my children physically see us as parents, right? We're a lot bigger than they are. We're a lot stronger than they are. There's reason for them to fear, right? If they wanted to disobey me, guess what? Dad's stronger. If they, you know, if I say you're going to be punished, you're going to get a spanking, and they say, no, I don't want a spanking, they, you know, they're going to get it. They're not going to overpower me. You know, they need to have that, that healthy fear. And we need to have that, you know, we're not going to overpower God by any means. But we don't always see him. And we don't want to have a, a, a distorted view of who God is in our own minds. Just because God is very loving and merciful and, 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 and treats us as his children and, you know, Jesus Christ referred to us as his brethren, right? We don't want to let that screw up how we talk to God. Hezekiah and, his, and, and the people that, that he had working for him, they understood this right away. They're like, we've got a problem and we need to make sure we're humble. We're not lifted up with pride. We can't deal with this. God needs to help us and we're going to go to God with humility. And that's why they put on the sackcloth and then they go to the prophet. They go to the man of God and they don't just go to someone calling themselves a prophet of the Lord just to tell them what they want to hear which is what other kings have done in the past, and you see how well that works out for them. That's what Israel was doing. They didn't want to hear a true prophet of the Lord. They just wanted to hear what they wanted to hear and just get some confirmation that, yep, what I, what I think is right. That's not the attitude Hezekiah had. Hezekiah had an attitude like, let's go to the man of God and just hear what he has to say. Let's just entreat, and hopefully the God will hear us and will help us out here. And we'll just do whatever God wants us to do. And that's right, and that's the attitude that we ought to have in our life. Look at verse number three. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy because of all the things that the, that the king of Assyria had said by his messengers, right? It's a day of trouble. They're bringing trouble against them, rebuke and blasphemy because they're blaspheming the Lord, the God of heaven. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. Now, Think about a time, what is referring to as a time of labor, right? When a woman's in labor, it's a time of, of great trouble. There's, there's all kinds of things going on. And when you get to that point of, of being in labor and ready for that baby to come out, what he's relating the situation they're into is, you know, we're here, we're going through the worst of the worst. And now we don't have enough strength to get through this to get past this and they're kind of stuck in this perpetual state of like at that worst state of your pregnancy and the women who had children here will know what I'm talking about that that last phase when it's like everything is just really intense the pain the everything and you just want it to stop and imagine not having enough strength to be at that point and just you, you just can't get that last push to finish and that's what he's, he's, you know, he's using this language to illustrate. We're in a day of trouble. There's all this stuff happening now. It's gotten, it's, things have gotten to a head. And we don't have the strength to, to get through this. We can't do this on our own, is what he's saying. Verse number four. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshaki, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. So this is what Hezekiah was, was saying, had his servants say and, and, and go to Isaiah to get the word from the Lord. And he's saying, we're just hoping that, that God can help us and that he'll reprove these people. And, and notice what he brings up is that, look, these people are bringing your name down, God. These people are doing all these things. And if you don't help us, you know, it's, it's, and he doesn't say it in these words, but basically it's kind of like if you don't help us, you know, they're bringing your name down and your name will look bad. And we're, I'm going to go over this a little bit later, but there's so many examples of the, in the Bible where 
God, care, God definitely cares about his name, and he uses situations to make sure the whole world knows that God is the Lord. He's the true God in heaven. There is none else. He is the Lord. And he uses situations that are completely impossible any other way. This is a completely impossible situation for, for Judah, for Jerusalem. It's completely impossible. They are so outnumbered. They don't have the military strength. They can't do this. They cannot win this battle because what's going to happen is that they would just be besieged and they would just wait them out and wait them out until they just had to give up and they have no resources left. That's what would happen. God is the only true God. He's the only one capable of answering these reproaches and this is why the gods of other lands couldn't do anything to save because they're not gods at all, right? Because they, they were boasting about, oh, what about the gods of Sepharvaim and of Hamath and of all these other places? And he's just like, what, what about them, huh? You know, we defeated all them. Their gods didn't save them because they're not gods. Turn, if you would, to Judges chapter 6. Keep your, keep your place here. Judges chapter 6. This reminded me um, what, they, what the, um, like the messengers from Sennacherib were saying reminds me of what happened with Gideon in Judges. Judges chapter 6. We're going to look at, start reading verse number 27. When God had... Uh, instructed Gideon to tear down the altar unto Baal. You remember the altar was, was reared up in the house of, his, of Gideon's father. And it was this big altar they had, and it was set up to Baal, and God told him to, to tear it down. So he went out at night, and he tore down the altar of Baal. You know, when everyone was sleeping, no one really saw him do it. Then they woke up, and they're like, oh, man, and you're getting all crazy and mad because someone tore down the altar, right? And that's who they worshiped. They were Baal worshipers, and they thought that Baal was their God and whatever else. So that's how, how tightly they held to that. Look at verse number 27 here in Judges 6. It says, Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. So he built an altar unto the Lord and put a sacrifice on there. And they said one to another, who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, bring out thy son that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore on that day he called him Jeroboam, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. And this is actually a pretty you know, decent statement here. There's, there's um, many times where God has proven himself in, in other instances. And you know these false gods have never done anything to prove that they're real. Baal, any, any, any false gods, any mytholo mythological creatures, none of them have ever proven anything. And people are just believing a lie, they're believing in things they make up in their own mind or what have you. But nothing, uh, none of these guys have ever been able to do that. And that's why, you know, Gideon's father is just saying, look, well, let's, if Baal's real, why, why doesn't he do something about it then? Why do we have to kill him for this? Let Baal do it. Let's see if Baal's real, right? And if Baal was real and was able to strike Gideon dead, then I'm sure everyone would fear, right? But it didn't happen because Baal's not a real god. He's a false god. He has no power. And you remember, I mean, the same thing happened when Elijah faced off against the prophets of Baal. I mean, we just read about that weeks ago. And, and you know, they're all doing all their sacrifices and they're, you know, they're, they're cutting themselves and, and chanting and doing whatever things that they think is going to get through to, to their false god. But in the end, he was a false god. He couldn't do anything. He had no power at all because it's not God. Amen. And that's why when Elijah did his sacrifice, the Lord answered with fire from heaven and consumed the, the sacrifice and licked up all the water and everything you know, and, and just made it unquestionable that this is God that this is the Lord, that this is the creator, that this is the supreme being. And there is none else. And God uses these events over and over again. There's many stories, like I said, I'm going to get into that in a little bit. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but there's many stories in the Bible where God is using this to bring glory and honor and respect unto his name. 
And I think sometimes he allows all you know, various things to happen just so that he can do that. I know what that is. I mean, the Bible tells us that it happens. He lifts people up literally just to bring them down. He allowed the king of Egypt to be lifted up just so that he could bring him down when he led the children of Israel out with Moses. He allowed for him to get to that state of power and allowed for him to be in that position and made it so that he hardened his heart so that he still wouldn't let him out so that God could just continue to show himself and his power and his might and that the whole world would know that Jehovah is Lord, that Jehovah is the God, that there is one God and this is who it is and don't mistake it because these events that happen get worldwide fame. Everybody ends up hearing about these things. Everybody heard about what happened with Moses and the children of Israel in Egypt. Everyone heard about that because they were scared when they were coming then to inherit the promised land. When they're going into Canaan, the Canaanites heard about what happened in Egypt and they were scared about it. That's what happened in, in Jericho. It happened in other places. You know, all these battles that they're having. They heard, they heard about their victories. They heard about the things that happened and they were scared because they knew that they were serving a real God and not these other gods that couldn't do anything. Let's go back to uh, 2 Kings 19. Verse number 5. So now Hezekiah is going to get an answer. Isaiah answers him. Right? They're going to God in humility and asking the prophet to just to, to, to get some help and see what God says. Verse number 5. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. And I think, honestly, this is probably the main theme of this chapter and something that you need to walk away with is when you're going to the Lord, one thing that we need to make sure that we don't do is, it says, be not afraid. We ought not to fear what man can do unto us. We fear the Lord, but no matter what your situation is, and we've covered this in 2 Kings previously because these situations happen and they've happened over and over again where some big, bad, strong enemy comes against you and you're completely outnumbered. But God says, don't be afraid. And, and when you fall into some fearful times in your own life, and oftentimes what, what makes us fearful is the unknown, when you're thrown into a situation you have no experience with, when, when something comes your way, when someone confronts you with something, when, when a loved one has a medical problem and you don't know anything about it, right? These are all times that we are going to be afraid because it's, it's foreign to us. We don't know how to deal with it. When a whole bunch of people surround your, your town and, and you're like, oh man, what do we do, right? This has never happened before. Those are the times when people get afraid. You, you don't get afraid... You know, people get afraid when they want to go out soul winning. They've never done it before because they don't know. It's, it's, it's fearful. But the more you've done it, you get experience and, and you learn things. And then it's not a big deal. and You don't have that fear, right? So people get this fear when you're, you're thrown into something new. But God's saying, don't be afraid. And if you're living for God and if you're, if you're going to God and seeking God, we don't have to be afraid of anything. So remember that when you do get thrown into a situation where you might be fearful, where you've never been in before, and you start to feel that fear, you can, if you know you're doing right, if you know that you're just, I mean, to the best of your ability, and not saying you're perfect, but if, you're, if you are, if you care about the Lord, if you're going to church, if you're reading your Bible, if you're going, so if you're, if you're doing things that you know that God is expecting you to do, if you're trying to listen to God, and you're going to God for your wisdom and instruction, then you don't have anything to fear. Amen. And take that away with you. You don't have to fear. God will lead you along, even, even though sometimes we could be stupid and ignorant and, and, and maybe make some bad choices. You know, we ought not to be afraid of the unknown. Now, I mean, we should do our best to, to get knowledge and to get wisdom and, and to, to get in the Word of God. But at the end of the day, you know, we, you can never know everything about everything. And there's always going to be situations that might be a little stressful and, and, and kind of put you into some fear. But we don't have to be afraid. We can rely on God. And that's the first thing that he says. The first words of his message to Hezekiah is, be not afraid. Don't be afraid of the words that are coming out of their mouth. Now, normally, without a God to protect, 
he ought to have been very afraid, right? I mean, he's coming at him with all this military force and all this power and everything against him. Of course, he should have been afraid, just speak, worldly speaking, right? Just the, the wisdom of this world. But not with God. Not when you have an almighty God to rely on. He says, don't worry at all. Don't be afraid. Because God can handle anything. And God's going to handle this. This is what he says. Um, because he knows, he says, which, uh, of the words which I was heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. God knows they blasphemed him. And God's going to stand up for his name and for his people. Look at verse number seven. Behold, I will send a blast upon him and he shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. And this is great. I mean, everything that, that Isaiah said is literally from the word of the Lord. And how do we know that? Because these things exactly hap, hap, happened the way that he said. They came to pass. That's how you know he's a prophet. That's how you know Isaiah's a prophet. Exactly what he said, thus saith the Lord, and it happened to a T. Verse 9, and how encouraging is that? When you hear the word, you hear God says not to be afraid, and then everything he says, like, wow, that all just happened. That's great. Like, that's, it's reassuring. It gives you even more comfort and, uh, and strength knowing that, yeah, this, I mean, this is, God is with us. Verse number 9, and when he, and when he heard say of Tirhaka, king of Ethiopia, Behold, he has come out to fight against thee. He sent messengers again unto Hezekiah. So this is the king of Assyria hearing that the king of Ethiopia, the Ethiopians now are coming against them to fight against them. So he wants to make sure, he's saying, you know, don't get too comfortable. You know, I've got this other thing I've got to deal with right now, but I'm coming back. Don't, don't think that you won this thing. You know, that's what he's, because he's, he still wants to instill fear in them. Even though everything that the prophet said, even everything that God was saying to Hezekiah, it, it happened exactly like that. So now this second time, how much do you think Hezekiah is going to be fearful of this? Not nearly as much when he knows what God has done already. Look at verse number 10. Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly. And shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the... And this is where he goes on and on about how, you know, don't, don't think that the Lord's going to protect you. I'm going to deal with this and come right back. Have any of the other gods delivered you out of, out of our hands? You know, have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed as Gozan and Haran and Rezeph and the children of Eden, which were in Thelazer? Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arpad and the king of the city of Sepharvaim, of Hena and Iva? And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And this is great. You know, when problems come your way, when people are afflicting you, when people are, are, are trying to destroy you, and here he has a letter. So what does he do? He goes to uh, our Father in heaven. He goes, look, look at what they're saying, God. Here's what they're doing. I'm bringing this to you because, because you're all right. I know you're going to help me. You've already helped me once, but God, I need you again. Please help. Look at what they're saying about your name. Look at what they're saying. They're comparing you, Lord, to these other false gods. They have no understanding at all, Lord. And, and this is the way that, you know, that he deals with this. And, and God obviously cares about it. Let's see in verse number 15. Let's keep reading. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. So this, the, the king, you know, Assyri the Assyrians were coming through and, and destroying these lands and taking their gods that they, you know, these people revered and just cast them in the fire, casting them down as they're nothing, just destroying them, wiping them out. And, and I believe as they continued, got more and more full of pride and haughty saying, who's going to stop us? These are all, fa you know, they didn't have any respect to their gods, which they were false gods anyways, but they're also treating the Lord 
as being not real and being fake and saying, we're just going to tear him down too. And God's like, no, you're not because I am real and you're going to understand this and the whole world's going to understand that I am not like those gods because they were, just, and that's what Hezekiah is saying. He's like, look, we know it's true, God. They have been going through and destroying other gods. But Hezekiah kind of saying, like, but we know that you're true. We know that you are the creator of heaven and earth. We know that you're real. And we know that those other gods were just wood and stone and, and you know, metal, whatever, and, and they're nothing. And they meant nothing. And that's why they were able to destroy them, because they are nothing. Verse 19, Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word that the Lord hath spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. This is, this is now God's response to Sennacherib, right? Saying that the... Um, the virgin, the daughter of Zion, had despised thee and laughed. You're know, basically saying God's words to Sennacherib is like, Israel's laughing you to scorn. You, you know, they're, 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 they, they have not fear for you at all, right? We don't care at all what you say. And, and going back at him with this attitude of like, who do you think you are, right? Coming from Judah. This is coming from God saying that they're laughing you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at thee, just like, you know, face palming. I can't believe Assyria is coming up against us. Like, how stupid, how ignorant. Don't you know that we have God on our side? This is the attitude that God's presenting or portraying again, you know, to Sennacherib. Look at verse 22. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? Now, this is a question to, to, to the king of Assyria. And against whom hast thou exalted, look at this, exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high. It's talking about the pride that the king of Assyria has. Even against the Holy One of Israel, against the Lord. That's who you're blaspheming. Verse 23, by thy messengers thou hast reproached the Lord and hast said, with the multitude of my chariots I am come up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and will cut down the tall cedar trees thereof and the choice fir trees thereof, and I will enter into the lodgings of his borders and into the forest of his Carmel. I have digged and drunk strange waters, and with the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of besieged places. This is the attitude that's coming from Sennacherib, right? His, his haughtiness and his pride. Look at verse 25 now. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it, and of ancient times that I have formed it? Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, and as corn blasted before it be grown up. But I know thy abode, and thy going out, and thy coming in, in thy rage against me. Because thy rage against me, and thy tumult has come up into mine ears, therefore will I put my hook in thy nose, and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way by which thou camest. God's saying, you know what? It's time for you to understand who's in charge here. It's time for you to understand that I'm the one that lifts up and brings down. And all those people you were able to destroy, I made it that way. And that's where he's, he comes up. He's saying, you know, your rage against me, his anger, his wrath against the Lord. He's saying, now I'm going to deal with you. And the bridle is something that, that you put in like a horse's mouth. And it's just a big stick, you know, so it goes in their teeth. And then you can just like yank on it from either side just to get them to turn this way or that way because it just controls their whole head. And then he talks about putting the, the hook in their nose. I mean, I don't know if you've ever like wrestled or, or fought anyone before. Like you get someone, you know, yanking on your nose, that hurts. That'll really get you to turn your head a certain way when someone's fish hooking your, your nose. And this is the way that God's saying he's going to deal with the, with the king of Assyria. So, you know, I'm going to put a bridle in your mouth like an animal and I'm going to hook your nose and I'm just going to tear you back and lead you back the way you came. You thinking you're going to come against me. 
and God's going to handle it and bring them down. And see, this is why we go to God with our problems because God can do these things. Hezekiah can't do these things. He needs God to do these things. And God will do these things, especially because they're seeking him and, and these people are, are bringing reproach against the name of the Lord. Verse 29, And this shall be a sign unto thee, you shall eat this year. Now this is, this is a sign for the people of Judah. This is for the children of Israel. He says, This shall be a sign unto thee, you shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves, and in the second year that which springeth of the same. Because remember, they're all packed into the city. Right? They're, they're in distress. They're under duress from, from the Assyrians coming against them. They can't spread out like in times of peace where you don't have to worry about being fenced in and protected, where you would be going out and, and cultivating your crops and doing all this other stuff. So what he's saying is that, and, and they've already been on high alert for a while at this point. Right? They've already kind of come and been besieged a little bit, so they haven't been able to keep up on planting things. So what God's saying is that just eat of what's produced. He said this year and next year. And then in the third year, you'll be able to sow and reap and plant your vineyards and eat thereof and everything will be back to order. And he says that you're um, in verse 30, and, and the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. He's saying you're going to be established. You're not going to be in this state of, of, of you know, being fearful and, and having everything up in the air. He says, you're going to be secure and you're going to be able to plant and plant down and get established and bring up fruit and, and you know, do good. And that's his promise. He says, so basically it's within three years. Everything's going to go back to normal. Everything's going to be just fine. And he's saying, I'm going to provide for you the first year and the second year, so don't worry about it. And then the third year, you'll go back right back to working and and, and uh, taking root. Verse 31. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. So this is God's answer, remember, because they had sent that other letter saying, you know, we have to take care of this thing, but we're coming back. And God's saying, yeah, that's not going to happen. He's saying they're going to come back, but they're not even going to get close enough to shoot any arrows. They're not going to get close enough to you guys to do anything. He says, I'm going to make sure of that. They're going to come and they're going to go back the way they came without ever being able to shoot one arrow into the city. And this is what happens. Look at verse number 34. For I, will, look, for I will defend this city. God is defending it to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Now we see different instances in the way that God helps people. Sometimes they do have to fight in battle, right? And, and, that, and God tells David, you know, in different you know, okay, go this way and do that and go in your battle. And God still gives them the victory, but they're doing the work and fighting. But in other situations, God does everything. And this is one of those situations. They don't have to go out and, and set up their, their battle and array and, and get ready to fight. God just says, you know what? I'm going to defend the city just completely on my own. And what happens is he sends an angel to go out in the night and these people, a hundred, look, a hundred and four score and five. That's 185,000 people. Imagine that. Imagine being part of an army, a huge army, right? Going to, to defeat Jer Jerusalem. You're, you're getting ready to battle. You're camped out. The next day you wake up there's 185,000 dead men. I mean, how many is 100? Uh, how, what would that look like? I don't even know. 185,000 people. That's a lot of people. How much do our you know, sports arenas hold? Not that many. 30, 40,000, 50? I don't know. I mean, I, I, how much? The, you know, that's a lot of people, right? You think about the traffic that, from people coming and going from football games and stuff like that. 185,000 people all died just, just boom, overnight. Dead. Decimating their forces coming out against Jerusalem. 
because God decided to do it. And they want to think that the Lord's not real? Yeah, they weren't quite so, so high and mighty anymore after this happened. They had to tuck tail and go back home in shame. Uh, the Bible says in verse 36, So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch his god, that Adramlech and Sherezer his sons smote him with the sword, and they escaped in the land of Armenia. And Ezar Hayden, his son, reigned in his stead. You know, the Bible says that, that pride goeth before destruction. And that's what happened here. The king of Assyria was lifted up in pride and was destroyed. And what, what 2 Kings doesn't tell us here, it, I mean, there's a, 2 Chronicles 32 is actually a very, very brief summary of this whole chapter. It's a, it's a very condensed version because 2 Chronicles goes into other events and other things that have happened with King Hezekiah and other things that were going on. But um, there is a section kind of dedicated to this. And in verse 21 of 2 Chronicles 32, the Bible says, And the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor. So this gives us a little bit more detail. It says 185,000 basically in 2 Kings 19. But it says here, which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So like the best of the best, right? The leaders, the captains, the mighty men of valor, the people who are really strong. We're going to go in. Those people died. And 185,000 people total died. But it was like their best people. This wasn't like you know, the, the, the infantry that wasn't that good, the people you might send in first because you don't care if they die or whatever. These are like the leaders wiped out. That's devastating. I mean, the, that's, that is so devastating for a military to lose like all of their leaders and their, their, their best veterans and mighty men of valor. Like, but that's what happened here. And it says, so he returned with shame to face his own land. And we didn't get that. I mean, we, you could have probably figured that out. But yeah, he was ashamed. Why was he ashamed? Because Judah was so small. Because he talked this big game and was, oh man, you guys, you ought to be afraid. Just give up now. We'll give you some horses, you know, some chariots if you could find people to put on the horses to fight against us. You know, and all these things that they were saying and mocking them and rebuking them and just reviling the Lord. To, they didn't even fight. They didn't even have to fight. 185,000 people just, you know, woke up dead. <laughs> they didn't wake up at all. Dead. Morning comes, 185,000 dead. We can't fight this battle. We're leaving. And that's what happened in this story. It's a pretty interesting story. And then it says in verse 23 of 2 Chronicles 32, And many brought gifts unto the Lord of Jerusalem in presence to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was magnified in the sight of all nations from thenceforth. God gets the glory. God received the glory for this victory because people were bringing gifts now all of a sudden, just like, wow, God's the Lord, right? I mean, the Lord is God. He's, he's the one, and people realize this. So King Hezekiah is now receiving presents and that he was magnified in the sight of all nations from there on out because of what happened to, to when God sent his angel to kill those men. And then people finally got the picture. Yeah, again, the Lord is God. And this theme is recurring of God defending his people where a mighty, scary, godless people are persecuting a weaker people. And when the afflicted call on the Lord, they're delivered. I already mentioned, you know, with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and the, the, the children of God, the people of God are being, um, you know, cast down and in trouble. God does all these miracles and sends all these plagues and makes known that the world knew from that point on that God is the Lord. We see the same thing with David and Goliath, right? David and Goliath, there's a lot of similarities to Hezekiah here. Hezekiah is relying on God and giving the glory to God, and God's the one he goes to, and God, it's God's battle, and God wins everything. When you read about David and Goliath, what's David saying? You know, he's, he's concerned because who is this reproaching the living God? He's defying the Lord. He's defying the Lord's people. He's saying, you know, the, the Goliath coming out, that Philistine, is just blaspheming the Lord and mocking and ridiculing the children of Israel and has no regard and no respect for the Lord of heaven. And David's like, who does this uncircumcised Philistine think he is to talk about God that way? 
It's not his own personal thing. It's the Lord that he cared about. And he said, you know, he, when he told Saul, you know, God delivered me out of the, out of the, the hand of the, the lion and the bear. God, God did that for me, that God's going to deliver this Philistine into my hand too. And even when he was running at him, he said, you, you come at me with a, with, a, with a sword and a spear. He said, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And won the victory because the victory was God's the whole time. And this undefeatable looking monster giant that everyone was afraid of, no one needed to be afraid of him at all. Because if God is fighting for you, you know, if God be for us, who could be against us? This is the theme. We see it with Nebuchadnezzar, right? Another person lifted up with pride. King of the whole you know, world at his time. Is, is, you know, he had his, his Babylonian empire. And then we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being told to bow down to a false god. And they wouldn't do it. And they were threatened with death. And what happened? Of course, God delivered them. God saved them. Again, God's name is magnified against those that would reproach the Lord. As, you know, as Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should let you go and worship? Who is that? Well, God made sure that Pharaoh knew who he was. Nebuchadnezzar ended up knowing who the Lord was. When he was out eating grass and have his, his fingers growing, you know, fingernails growing long and his hair became like feathers and all this, you know, became like a beast out in the field for seven years until he finally realized, you know what, there's a God in heaven and he's the one that controls things and it's not me. And it's not my greatness that made all this happen. It was actually God who made these things to happen. You think of, I mean, this, the stories go on and on. You think of Esther and Mordecai and wicked Haman. Haman was out to destroy the people of God. And, and you know, they had to, to, to call on the Lord and, you know, have God protect them that way. It were, you know, through using Esther and Mordecai to... to you know, to get things right over and over again, multiple times during the reign of the kings and of the judges, they're being afflicted. They call on the Lord and the Lord saves them out of their troubles over and over again. And we see this is such a common theme. We need to get this through our heads that like it doesn't matter what your situation is. Nothing is unique. No matter what your situation is, you need to be relying on God. And my friends, you know, I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. When you go through the hard times, the last thing that you need to do is be getting out of church and being getting away from God and, oh, I need a break from all of this. No, you need to be getting in even more. When you're getting attacked, when you're having problems, but you don't understand. I don't need to understand. What problem was there that was too big for God? And what problem is there where God says, you know what? It's best for you to just stay away from me, stay away from my house and not come to church and not be around believers, not be around your spiritual family. It's better for you just to be off and be alone. When do you ever see that in the Bible anywhere one time? You're not going to find it. It's man's wisdom that thinks you need a break. And unfortunately, what happens is when people end up going that route, they get out. They end up getting out completely because it gets a lot easier to stop coming and stop living for the Lord because, look, let's face it, living and doing what's right and, and, and you know, working for God isn't the easiest life in the world to do. It is work. There is maybe a little bit added stress or pressure to do things, to, to get things done and try to be pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. But it's rewarding in the end, that's where our faith comes in. We have to maintain that faith to know that in the end, as I was preaching last night, Brother Matthew, you were with me on patience and having that patience to get through the difficult times and the hard times of knowing that in the end, it's worth it. In the end, God blesses us, but we need to have that sight of the unseen and keeping our eyes on the goal and not being afraid or scared off no matter, what, no matter how big the giant is in front of you. No matter how large the enemy appears before you, they that be with us are greater than they that be against us. We have God. God has angels. We have people to protect us. We have no reason to fear, but we need to be staying within the will of God. We need to be listening to him and doing what's right. 
God uses all these events to get glory to his name um, far and wide. Now, the last point I want to make, and this is really interesting, and, and, and I recommend you go home and, and kind of check this out for yourself later on. Isaiah 36, 37, and 38 are all, I mean, literally almost word for word identical to 2 Kings 18, 19, and 20. So these stories about Hezekiah are recorded in the book of Isaiah, literally almost word for word. But the reason why I want to bring this up and just make mention of it and for you to kind of check out later is to look at the, the, the minor differences. And this kind of goes to a point for me to explain what I believe about God's word being preserved and perfect and when it comes to translations still being the word of God and being perfect. Obviously, I don't want to minimize that we believe every word of God is pure and true and important. Every word of God is important. And we do our Bible memory. It has to be perfect. It has to be exact. But when it comes to God's word being preserved and translated and being perfect and complete and without error, I don't want people to shake your faith. And that's why I explain what I believe. When you look at these different parallel passages between Isaiah and 2 Kings, you will see words maybe in a different order. Same words, but just, you know, there's a comma in one place and they're just, they're just swept, swapped. But it says the exact same thing, right? I mean, literally the exact same thing, but they're just repositioned. When the translation of the King James Bible was being done, there was obviously a word-for-word -word type of translation where they cared the most about the words they were translating to make sure that they're accurate and represent exactly what it says and translating that to English. However, there was a little bit of freedom used in the order of the words to make it sound good, to make it go together well, and it could still all be perfect and without error while that was being done. Okay, and the reason why every word is important because every word carries a meaning. So when you start changing the words up, you, you literally will start changing the meaning up. Not everything is a direct, you know, not every word has direct synonyms. I mean, it may be really close or whatever, but, and I believe that every word that we have here is important and is true, but, um, you know, we need to understand to what degree should we be concerned with the word of God and the preservation of God's word, right? Like, so what I mean by that is, are we going to be really concerned and bent out of shape about the spelling of a word, right? Like if you have a Bible, there's, oh, well, you know, some people get all upset. Oh, Savior's not spelled with a U and it needs to have a U. Otherwise, you know, it's like, it's the same word. It has the same exact meaning. That spelling difference means nothing. Literally nothing. God didn't, pro and what about punctuation, right? A comma or a semicolon or even a question. You know, I mean, like these things are, God didn't promise to preserve every last little detail when it comes to those things, the spelling and punctuation, but he did promise to preserve his words, right? And men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So it's the words that are most important, not the spelling, not the punctuation. And I believe when it comes to a translation that, the words stating the same thing, the words being translated properly, but being moved around a little bit to, to, because it sounds good or whatever is not a problem. There's not, you know, I, I, that's one of those things where we don't have to be so focused with a microscope on God's word being perfect to that degree, to that extent, if that makes sense. You might understand, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm having a hard time really explaining this well, but when you read, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. And don't forget, if there's some words missing, you know, Isaiah is a different book than 2 Kings. They're recording the same events, but like, they were, they're different books from, from different people, even though so much of it literally is like almost word for word. It is word for word in, in for the major, vast majority of it. But when you compare the two, you'll see what I, you kind of see what I'm talking about. And like, it's not an, it's not an, it's not a problem. It's not an issue there. It has nothing to do with God's word. Oh, it's not being preserved perfectly or something. It just, it is preserved perfectly. I mean, and, and it's, and we don't need to be focused on the minutia of these little tiny things when it's, it literally, so you, you read that and you're like, yeah, this is the same, the same exact story. Everything's being said. And obviously, sometimes when there's in different books, especially, 
There's more details maybe added, like we've been looking with the Chronicles versus the Kings and getting different pieces of information between the two. And again, God, it's not that either one is false or contradictory. It's just more information being added. So I just kind of wanted to make that point that we don't need to be so focused on these little details. I mean, if there was a, if there was a Bible translation out there that wasn't the King James Bible, but literally maybe used a different word that was a synonym, I wouldn't say that's no longer the word of God. I believe that these are the words of God. There's no need to change anything. But if there was a word, if, if you had everything exactly the same, copied word for word, and then one word had a complete synonym and it was swapped out, that's still the word of God. That's what I believe. I, you know, I don't, I'm not, I, I, but there's no reason to do that, right? But I'm just saying that like it would still be the same thing. So when you look at the earlier versions, the revisions prior to the King James Bible, when they might have been using um, Passover, you know, if they use Passover instead of Easter, or Easter instead of Passover, something like that, right? I don't think that makes it not the Word of God. Either way, because they mean the same exact thing. They're, bo they're both legitimately the Word of God. And you'll see that when you, when you compare like these types of, of passages. You'll see the, su the, the, the very, very, very subtle differences in the, in, the, in the account, but it says the literally the exact same thing. And it's not something we need to be worried about and, and have that be some kind of stumbling block for, for oh no, I don't know, is this, is this really God's word now? Yeah, no. So anyways, that's about right as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words and we thank you for preserving your words and that we don't have any reason to doubt your words today, that even though it's 2017, that you've done the work for us, just as much as you won the victory in the battle for Hezekiah and, and slew 185,000 men through the, through the uh, angel that you sent to, to kill them, Lord, um, just as much as you have that power and did that amazing feat, an amazing act, I believe it with, with full assurance that you have also made sure that we have your words the way that you want them for us today. God, I pray that you would please help us to have more faith. I pray that you please help us to, to not be afraid and to trust in you and that we could um, be living the, the lives to the best of our ability to be following your laws and um, that we would be going to you with our problems and, and listening to hear from your words to get the guidance and the wisdom that we need to, uh, to make sure that we can be safe, Lord, that, that we could be uh, protected from evil and that, and that any evil that comes our way, we don't have to worry or fear, but that we can just completely rely on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.